OK, so the title of my talk is Stress in the Brain, the Good, the Bad, and the Misunderstood. Um, another title that I could have given the talk is In Defense of Stress. Because we all talk about stress as if it were a bad thing, but the point of this series is to inspire you. So I'd like to inspire you. Millions of years of evolution have ensured that your stress system does exactly what it's supposed to do. It works perfectly. You're the problem. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to show you why you're the problem. <laughs> so stress and why it matters. The first thing that we need to do, and we're going to have kind of a fun lecture, but just get a little bit of biology out of the way, real quick, quick and dirty. When we have a stressor, the first thing that happens is what? We have a fight or flight response. This happens immediately. There's this part of your brain very deep down, the locus ceruleus. He's going to tell your adrenal gland, ah, I'm getting eaten by a tiger. Release epinephrine. If you're in Europe, you can call it adrenaline. It's the same chemical. It doesn't matter. You're going to release adrenaline. The sympathetic nervous system does a very good job of doing what we in college like to refer to as the four Fs. Fight, flight, fright, and sex. <laughs> so these are the four things that it does. <laughs> it's going to keep you alive whether you like it or not. No conscious choice here. Or keep you alive in the future. <laughs> This system acts very, very quickly. Uh, a little bit later on, we get this sort of slower acting system. This little part of our brain up here, the hypothalamus, which is really the, the CEO of all of the hormones in your body, the hypothalamus is going to say, oh my god, we're stressed. He's going to tell the pituitary gland, hey, release this other hormone, ACTH. ACTH is going to fall down. And then he's also going to tell the adrenal gland, the adrenal cortex, the same place that spurts out all that epinephrine, he's going to say, release cortisol and we've all heard about cortisol cortisol makes you fat cortisol does horrible things to you oh we hate cortisol but cortisol keeps you alive if there's a tiger who's going to come eat you cortisol will keep you alive so the problem isn't cortisol the problem is the dysregulation of cortisol what cortisol does then is it's going to go back up to all of those places who originally released it and it's going to say whoa slow down the major place in our body that binds cortisol is the hippocampus so you listen to Matt's talk. We all know what the hippocampus does, right? It's important for memory. It's also important for cortisol. <laughs> and all those cortisol receptors are in the hippocampus, and it binds to the hippocampus, and it says, hey, stop. But if you have too much cortisol being released, the cells can't handle it, and they just die. Like, oh, we can't handle it. We're going to die. And they kill themselves. <laughs> then you get more cortisol released. You have even less cells to handle it. You see what's happening here? And so this H, what we call the HPA, the hypothalamus pituitary adrenal gland, this axis just sort of spurts out of control. Okay, and this is where some of the problems arise. Okay, this can happen acutely or this can happen chronically, right? You get stressed, this stuff happens to you. You get stressed over and over and over again, it's this idea of chronic stress. But we, it turns out we actually have two different ways of responding to stress. We do have this biological process that occurs, the sort of sympathetic nervous system and the HPA axis. But then in our brains, we're going to respond differently to different types of stress in slightly different ways. And the major way of differentiating those is between physical stress and psychological stress. So the difference between getting eaten by a tiger, there were some real pictures, but it wasn't pleasant. <laughs> or, or this. OK. Or. If you're Ryan Gosling, you might be stressed because your picture's all over the internet these days. <laughs> okay, we all have these kinds of stressors. And as my colleague alluded to earlier, it's very stressful not to be able to use copyrighted images. So I wanted to give you this basic, Ooh, what is stress? So stress for us isn't getting eaten by a tiger. Right? Our body is ready to respond to that. It's ready to respond to starvation. It's very, very well adapted to responding to someone wanting to punch you in the face, someone trying to steal your mate. It does a very good job of that. But what we experience is daily life hassles. That's really our stress. And does this happen acutely, or does this happen all the time, multiple times a day? <laughs> so I wanted to give you sort of an example. And since I couldn't use copyrighted images, I'm going to tell you the things that stress me. But I imagine that you have some of the same things going on in your life. So the first thing that stresses me are my colleagues. <laughs> they make me nuts. <laughs> Except the ones who are here, they're, they're wonderful <laughs> people. <laughs> OK, my bosses, who are not here tonight, make me crazy. <laughs> so I imagine you have bosses who give you stress, too, for different reasons. 
he may look nice, he scares me. <laughs> this guy used to be a hostage negotiator, and now he's my boss. <laughs> And evidently, I'm kind of glad to hear so many of the presenters tonight get stressed by students texting in their class because it's one of the major things that stresses me out because I'm trying to lecture and no one's paying attention to what I'm saying and I think it's very important and I have theory of mind so I'm thinking about what they're talking about and thinking about and texting and I'm not thinking about what I should be thinking about. It's awful. It's a whole thing and then I start to shake and leave the classroom. <laughs> so you can imagine looking out at this, trying to talk and educate young minds and this is what you see. My husband. <laughs> We're working on it. <laughs> My children. <laughs> they're twins and they're five. <laughs> it's not that my husband and children are enough to drive me crazy, but they have a dog. <laughs> it's their dog. It's my source of stress. Okay, so you get the idea. These are probably the same types of things that are happening to all of us every day, multiple times a day. So it's not just that it happens to some people and it doesn't happen to other people. Some people are more at risk of succumbing to some of the health consequences of all of these things. So these are the things that are going to kind of put you at risk. Keeping in mind, this is what your stress response system is evolved to do. This is what it's really doing, right? Dealing with all of these things. So the things that are going to heal you, basically, it's unremitting stress. And it's not, it turns out, it's not just unremitting stress. If you really want to kill somebody, you don't want to use pharmacology, <laughs> you don't want to go to jail, the good way to do it is unremitting, unpredictable stress. <laughs> so if I wanted to kill my husband, and I don't, he's a wonderful person and a biologist, but if I did, if I you know, went in every day and I punched him in the face at 2 p.m., Every day I go and punch him in the face at 2 p.m. What's going to happen? Is he going to get really stressed? He might divorce me. But <laughs> is he going to get really, really stressed? No, because what's going to happen? He's going to be like, oh, I know she's going to come punch me in the face. Right. So what you really, really, really want to do is you want to give somebody stress that they don't know what's going to happen, and it's never ending. Right? That's the good, that's the good stuff. <laughs> so, we're so one of the worst things you can do for yourself, one of the worst careers you can do, and I'm sorry if you do this. <laughs> it's long-term caregivers. These guys are in a host of trouble. You, know, you never know if Johnny's going to have a good day, a bad day. You can't control what's happening. This is awful for your health. Make your aunt do it. Don't be that guy. OK, so the inability to adjust to stress. And this is me. I'm, gonna, I'm a high responder rat. <laughs> high, and you know who these people are, too. These are the people who just react to everything. Right? My boss yells at me. I freak out. My, my, Co colleagues said, oh, you were late today, and I'm worried about it. Everything kind of gives us increased heart rate very easily. This is not a good way to live your life. <laughs> the other thing is reactivation to stress, and you know who you are, and you know, you know who these other people are because they don't leave you alone. These are the people that something happens to them, oh, my boss yells at me, and then I go home like, oh, my God, you're not going to believe what my boss did. He yelled at me. And then I say the whole thing. And then I call my 10 closest friends, and I tell them what happened. <laughs> and every time I do this, I'm reactivating that same HPA axis. I don't need the tiger to bite me. I can make that stuff happen just by thinking about it. And the last thing is, I guess these would be the psychopaths. <laughs> so a blunted HPA activation, it's also not good to not respond to stress at all. You need a little bit of stress to respond. So we don't want our HPA axis to get dysregulated. We don't want to die of stress. We want to live healthy lives. Um, so I know you're really depressed right now. <laughs> <laughs> So the good news is, because the source of stress for us is in our heads, we're making it up, no one's punching us in the face, nobody's starving us, we're all living long and healthy lives, hopefully. Uh, all the stress that we have is coming from here. It's processive, it's psychological, it's, it's, it's that kind of stress that we're constantly thinking about. So the good news is you won't die from stress, maybe, if I show you the next few slides. <laughs> you are in control of your stress. Okay, so I'm going to give you some human displacement activities. This is what we do for animals in stress labs when we want them not to succumb to stress. And, and as, not, as human animals, we can do the same things. Okay, the first thing you can do is psychotherapy. It's a lot of work, but it has been demonstrated that psychotherapy does produce 
genuine, real changes in that neuroplasticity in your brain. It just takes a long time to do it, but if you do it, you can get real plasticity, real changes into your, in your brain. Exercise, believe it or not. Exercise does a very good job at relieving some of the symptoms of stress. You can read an enlightening book. <laughs> These are things that have been clinically demonstrated to relieve the consequences of stress. You can have good social support, like our nice uh, presenter here, Leanne Boucher. You could have good sleep hygiene. <laughs> this may include, I study sleep too, this may include taking a nap during the day, that's okay, you can do that. Or whatever works for you. This is uh, my colleague Jason Gershman who likes to race cars and that's a great way for him to relieve his stress. The other thing that I wanted to talk to you about, if those things didn't work for you, there's a lot of really cool research uh, right now coming out of a, one particular lab, uh, the University of Wisconsin at Madison, this uh, professor Richard Davidson, and some of the things that he's shown in his lab, he's actually gotten the Dalai Lama and some Tibetan monks to come in and he's looked at their brains. And what he's demonstrated is, and these monks, they actually show real um, differences in their EEGs. So some of the brain waves that we associate with higher processing, high mental function, seem to be much higher in the monks than they are in, in controls. And some of the brain regions that we associate with love and understanding and empathy, the insula and the left prefrontal cortex, seem to be more activated. Uh, these monks tend to do compassion meditation, but I'm guessing this would work for all forms of meditation. They've even trained uh, regular guys like you and me to do meditation, and you, we can show these changes. Uh, so this is very cool. Uh, the hard part is I should tell you that <laughs> these monks had 10,000 hours of training, so it did take a long time. But if you're willing to do it, you can just be happy like a monk, do some meditating. If that doesn't work for you, <laughs> You can always take Prozac. <laughs> Better living through chemistry, as, as Dr. Ray said. So uh, whereas going to therapy takes a long time, therapy would be sort of the analogy of go going to the gym. You know, we all want big muscles. We all want to be healthy. We all want to look great. But if you go to the gym, it takes a long time to get big muscles and, and look great and have a great cardiovascular health. If I gave you a pill that could do all of those things, come on. <laughs> <laughs> So this, this sort of does what psychotherapy does. Dr. Wright will tell you if there's consequences to it. <laughs> so the good news is, remember I told you when you have all those super, super high levels of cortisol, it kills those hippocampal cells? Well, it turns out, and the dirty secret behind Prozac, and Dr. Ray, I'm, I'm sorry, is that we have no idea how it works. No clue. No clue. If I give you Prozac, your serotonin levels are going to be pretty high right away, but when are you going to start to feel better? This is what the pharmacologists don't want you to know. We don't know how most of this stuff really works. <laughs> it takes a while to feel better, but it turns out one of the mechanisms by which it may be working is increasing new neurons in the hippocampus. You get an increased neurogenesis in the hippocampus. So it might be that as cortisol goes up, starts to destroy those hippocampal neurons, you have fewer hippocampal neurons, and you get into this sort of cascade hypothesis, the cascade that one researcher calls the glucocorticoid cascade hypothesis. When you get somebody Prozac, it may increase the amount of neurons and help to restore some of the functioning of the hippocampus. So Prozac does increase neurogenesis in the hippocampus. And if you block neurogenesis in, in the hippocampus, you also block the behavioral effects of Prozac. So that's sort of, I think, interesting. And it's new research, so we'll see where it goes. So I would say the bottom line today is just sort of keep in mind Stress system is fine. It's working properly. It wants to keep you alive. It wants to keep you alive for the next five minutes. It doesn't care if you're going to live to 100. Uh, so I would say try to do all of those things. Recognize that you're in control of how stressed you become. Uh, and that's all I have for you. Hopefully you have a, a new beginning. Thank you.